Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome. I am Merely Profit, Senior Manager for the OCLC Research Library Partnership, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Acquiring RDM Services for Your Institution. Before we get started, I have just a couple of meeting logistics to cover. To eliminate background noise and to make it easier to hear the presenters, you are in a listening-only mode during the presentation today. If you have any problems throughout the webinar, please submit a chat message to me and I will do my best to help you. Uh, our speakers will present and then we will take questions at the end, but please submit questions and comments as we go along. To get warmed up, I'm going to ask everyone to find their chat window and introduce yourselves. Uh, if you are attending as part of a group, please let us know that. Uh, when you are typing your question into the text box, please be sure that the send option is set to all participants and not all attendees and click send. This will ensure that the panelists and the attendees can see your question um, or your comment. On a final note, we are recording this webinar and we'll make the recording available afterwards as well as the slides so you will have the opportunity to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And so with those housekeeping details attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. Uh, and at this point, I am going to turn things over. I'm going to switch the slides around a little bit and turn things over to Brian. And okay. ready to take it away, Brian. Yes, thank you, Marilee. Um, and I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the third and final installment of our OCLC Research Library Partnership webinar series, where we've been um, looking at the findings of the realities of research data management project, um, which examines some of the ways that research universities have been acquiring RDM capacity. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the final webinar in the series. I, I hope you had an opportunity to participate in the previous two webinars, um, as well as the RDM interest group discussions, which followed uh, each of them. If not, recordings of each of the webinars are available online, um, as well as summaries of the interest group discussions that took place. And I'll provide some links to uh, these resources at the end of the talk. In today's webinar, we're going to be looking at how universities are making decisions about acquiring RDM services with an emphasis on sourcing and scaling choices. So just some housekeeping details, um, and you know, just for the record, the, the Realities of RDM Project is an initiative of OCLC Research, which conducts research aimed at the challenges facing libraries and archives in a rapidly changing information environment. And then this webinar was prepared for the members of the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which as I'm sure you all know, is a venue to which more than 100 research libraries engage with OCLC Research staff and each other on issues and challenges that benefit from collective attention and collective action. Now, for those of you who may have missed the first two webinars, I'll just spend a couple minutes uh, giving you some background on the realities of RDM project. So for universities, um, research data is probably the most visible and um, uh, immediately impactful aspect of a scholarly record that's evolving to incorporate a wider range of research outputs. And this has led to efforts on the part of universities to build or acquire capacity to support emerging research data management needs. So the realities of research data management is an OCLC research project looking at the context, the influences, and the choices that research universities face in building or acquiring RDM capacity. Now I want to note that we're looking at this as an institutional issue, not just from the library perspective. Obviously the academic library is a very important campus player in RDM, but it's not the only one. So if we focus on libraries only, 
that would tend to give an incomplete picture of the current state of RDM uh, on many uh, campuses. So our focus uh, is on three major decision points that universities face in acquiring RDM capacity. Um, deciding to act, in other words, the incentives to build or acquire RDM capacity. Deciding what to do, um, you know, scoping out a bundle of RDM services, and then deciding how to do it. So for example, deciding which services will be built locally and which will be externalized to an outside provider. Our findings are derived from case studies of four research universities, uh, University of Edinburgh in the UK, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the US, and Monash University in Australia, and Bagenegen University in Research in the Netherlands. So four universities situated in four very different national contexts. And then the case studies were constructed from a combination of interviews and desk research. A uh, quick look at the project staff, including uh, my colleague Rebecca Bryant, who's uh, here with us today, as well as Constance uh, Malpas, who actually is no longer with OCLC, but um, at the time of the project, she was a, a very important contributor. So I wanted to acknowledge that here. Uh, the primary deliverables from the project are four reports. The first provides an overview of the RDM service space, and then the remaining three deal with the three major decision points that I mentioned a couple slides ago. All of these reports are available on the project website, which I'll reference at the end of the talk. So our first webinar covered the findings of the first two reports. The second webinar discussed the third report, and in the rest of this webinar, uh, we're going to look at some of the key messages from the fourth and final report. Let me start by just quickly refreshing everyone's memory on a couple of important concepts we touched on in the previous webinars. So in our first report, we constructed a um, a simple framework to summarize the RDM service space. So in other words, the landscape of infrastructure and services um, that RDM capacity is expected to address. Um, and we divide that service space up into three major components. So the first component there is education. So education-related RDM services are focused on raising awareness of the importance of or the incentives for um, good data management both in service to open science, uh, but then also to meet uh, compliance obligations. Um, these services help disseminate you know, basic data management practices and skills, and they also disclose the array of um, RDM resources that are available uh, to researchers. Expertise. Uh, now, expertise-related RDM services are usually human-mediated services that are focused on solving specific data management problems that are encountered by researchers during the research process. So here we're moving beyond the awareness-raising function of education services, and we're focusing on the specialized knowledge of data librarians, technologists, and other staff um, to help ensure that individual RDM needs and requirements are met during the research process. And then lastly, uh, curation. So RDM curation services basically offer the technical functionality that's needed to manage data sets throughout the research life cycle, um, and especially, of course, um, repository services. So this framework is intended to help just circumscribe the kinds of services that universities are looking to build uh, or acquire in the RDM space. And you'll find a detailed discussion of this framework in our, in our first report. Now the second concept um, I want to quickly um, review is the idea of an RDM service bundle. So when we say the RDM service bundle, we mean the set of RDM services that are offered by a university. Um, to its researchers. And it's important to note that this includes not just what's built and deployed locally, but also any external services to which the university um, facilitates or brokers access uh, on behalf of its uh, researchers. So if you think about the RDM service space, the big gear, gear there in the middle, 
you can imagine this network of RDM service bundles emerging from it, each one represent, representing um, the offering of RDM services at a particular university. Um, and it's important to keep in mind, though, that, th that these individual service bundles are not going to be identical. The specific mix of RDM services uh, is going to vary from university to university, uh, depending on local needs and priorities. And it's also important to note then it's perfectly fine if a university decides not to implement services in one or more of these categories. So for example, um, maybe a university could decide it really isn't necessary to deploy curation services for its researchers. Um, so this, this service framework really represents the scope of the RDM services that a university potentially could implement. It's, it's not the services that they necessarily should implement in all circumstances. So this concept of the RDM service bundle is introduced and discussed in detail in our second report. So I'll be referring to you know, the, these concepts of the RDM service space and the RDM service bundle throughout the rest of the talk. So I, I just wanted to make sure everyone was um, familiar with, um, with those ideas. Okay, so let's talk about um, sourcing RDM services. Now by sourcing, we mean a fundamental choice when acquiring an RDM um, uh, service bundle. Will the services be developed and deployed internally or will they be externalized to an outside provider? So in essence, this is the familiar you know, build or buy question. But in the context of RDM services, it could get a little more nuanced than that. So first, when we say that a, a, a service was sourced internally, we don't necessarily mean that, you know, starting from a blank slate. The service could have been developed using components that were acquired elsewhere, um, such as open source applications, for example. And then they're um, integrated and, and customized to meet local requirements. And in fact, one of our case study partners, uh, Edinburgh, um, adopted this approach in developing some of its internally sourced RDM services. So for our purposes, we'll consider a service to be internally sourced if it's built, customized, or adapted, and then deployed, maintained, and evolved primarily through local effort and resources. And in the same way, the notion of externalization or external sourcing can have different um, meanings as well. So an RDM service can be externalized to a commercial service, which is maybe the most common thing people might think of when they hear you know, externalization or, or outsourcing. Um, but it can be externalized to other providers as well, to a collaborative effort among peer institutions, to a nonprofit organization, to a national agency, or even to another university. So the RDM service space is becoming um, populated with a, an assortment of service providers. And today, universities that want to externalize RDM services are often going to find that they have multiple options to choose from in terms of the type of provider um, that they want to work with. And one last point I want to make about sourcing choices is that in practice, they apply to individual RDM services, not the service bundle as a whole. So you'll usually see that a university's RDM service bundle is a mix of both internally and externally sourced services, although it may tend to lean toward one form of sourcing or the other. So let's have a look at some sourcing choices in the context of our case study partners. And, and here we're focusing on curation services. Um, so that one part of the RDM service space. So in this figure, we marked out three sourcing options for RDM curation service provision. So starting on the left, the first is to build it locally, or in other words, internal sourcing. Then we split the external sourcing option into two choices. You can externalize it to a cooperative effort of partner institutions, or you can externalize it to a third-party provider. 
such as a uh, commercial service. Now, in looking at our four case study partners uh, and thinking about their curation services, we found that we could locate them at different points along this sort of continuum of sourcing options. So starting on the left there with Edinburgh. Edinburgh is very oriented towards sourcing their curation services locally. Um, and actually, they see themselves as a pioneer in this space uh, in terms of building a, um, a, you know, a fairly comprehensive RDM uh, suite of services from the ground up. Illinois shows a slightly different pattern. While nearly all of their RDM curation services are locally sourced, they tend to view this more as a, as a, um, a current necessity rather than as a desired outcome. Ideally, they would like to move more toward the center of the picture with more cooperatively sourced services deployed at group scale. Now, Wageningen does represent a group scale approach to sourcing and scaling RDM curation services. And here they have limited services that are built and deployed locally. And instead they rely on this sort of external ecosystem of RDM services that are deployed at both the consortial and national scale. And then lastly, Monash represents still another approach to acquiring RDM curation capacity. So in addition to a number of collaborative sourcing choices that they've engaged in, they've also contracted with a third party commercial provider, um, Figshare, through um, digital science um, as a uh, sort of a centerpiece for their RDM curation services. Um, when the service bundle was initially developed at Monash, um, the prevailing ethos there was that services should be developed internally only when absolutely necessary. So four different universities and you know, four distinct pr perspectives on sourcing RDM curation service offerings. And you know, the point where each university locates itself in this framework is then influenced by a mix of internal and external factors which determine the most appropriate sourcing arrangement um, for each university. Let's take a, a closer look at a couple of the RDM service bundles from our case study partners and talk a little bit more about their sourcing choices and how they came about. So this is a look at Edinburgh's RDM service bundle. And you know, as you can see, they've implemented services in all three RDM service categories, education, expertise, and curation. But as I mentioned um, on the last slide, one of the distinguishing features of Edinburgh's um, service bundle is that for the most part, they sourced it locally. Um, now, their service bundle was shaped by a, a strong and very early university commitment to data management, um, coupled with an external environment that tended to mandate uh, responsible data management uh, and sharing of data. But as an early adopter in the RDM service space, they almost by necessity had to develop their own RDM capacity, or in other words, source it locally, because external RDM service options were relatively scarce at the time. So I think this underscores you know, sort of an obvious, but still I think important point that sourcing decisions will depend a great deal on the spectrum of RDM service options that are available outside the university. So you know, obviously if there are a few viable external service options, then this will tend to favor internal sourcing. Now interesting, when we, when we interviewed um, the RDM staff at Edinburgh, they also noted that while the university has traditionally favored home-built solutions in areas like RDM, um, th this perspective is beginning to shift um, today. Um, so in terms of RDM, um, you know, the, the staff we interviewed made a, an, an interesting distinction between RDM curation services that focus on supporting current access and network visibility of data sets in comparison to those that are focused on supporting long-term preservation. And for Edinburgh, preserving scholarly materials is a long-standing part of the institutional mission. As one of the staff members put it, the, the, you know, they, they've basically been doing it since the 1500s. Um, so therefore, that makes it a high priority in terms of um, maintaining internally supported 
or I'm sorry, internally sourced uh, capacity for preservation. But in contrast, services that are mainly directed toward providing current access, um, um, you know, for those services, solutions external to the university may be appropriate. Um, so the key point here is that sourcing choices will tend to align with broader institutional priorities, um, such as preservation, preservation in the case of um, Edinburgh. Now we can get a different perspective on sourcing choices when we look at Bogenagen's RDM service bundle. So like Edinburgh, uh, Bogenagen provides services in all three of the RDM service categories. Um, but unlike Edinburgh, many of these services are sourced externally, uh, particularly in regard to curation services. Um, so Wageningen developed their RDM service bundle more recently than Edinburgh, and, and therefore they were able to utilize some important external RDM curation services that were already in place, such as the 4TU uh, Research Data uh, Repository, uh, which is a group scale service maintained by a consortium of Dutch uh, technical universities. Um, and Wageningen joined that consortium in 2016. So this is essentially the mirror image of the point we made about Edinburgh's sourcing uh, choices. Relatively late adopters in the RDM service space are likely to have more external sourcing options as the RDM service space continues to develop and mature. Now another factor shaping um, Wageningen sourcing choices was th their perceived internal capability. So Wageningen took the view that building and managing data curation infrastructure and services requires a special expertise that the university hadn't really developed internally yet. So given this, the decision to utilize the um, consortial scale 4TU repository, as well as the, um, the national scale Don's Easy uh, data repository, uh, was considered a better solution for Wageningen's um, circumstances. So this illustrates the point that sourcing choices are also going to depend on the university's willingness and capability to develop and deploy the services and infrastructure needed to support RDM. And it's important to note that there's no single right answer here. So for some universities, internal sourcing works well. For others, like Wageningen, external options prove to be a better fit. One last point about uh, Wageningen that I wanted to note. Um, in the interview with um, the Wageningen staff, they noted that they had some advantages of working within the relatively small Dutch higher education system because in that environment everyone seems to know everyone else and as a result trust networks are very strong which in turn helps facilitate collaboration around RDM services such as say the 4TU um, data repository. So another general lesson that we might draw from this is that we might expect external sourcing to be more prevalent in environments where there's a strong history of successful collaboration around issues of mutual interest, all, of the, all other things uh, being equal. Here is, um, here's a few other findings about RDM sourcing decisions that um, emerged from our case studies that I, that I wanted to highlight. Um, we found that of the three major RDM service categories, um, education expertise and curation, it was really cre curation services that were most likely to be externalized. Um, now one of the key factors influencing this is the availability of national or group scale RDM curation services and infrastructure. So as we've seen, Wageningen externalized much of its RDM curation capacity um, to both consortial and national scale services, um, uh, in particular with 4TU and DONS. In contrast, we could look at another case study partner, Illinois, most of their RDM services were developed internally, and this partially reflects, I think, the fact that the U.S. lacks the kind of national or group scale RDM solutions that are available in um, some other countries. Now, for RDM curation services that were sourced internally, um, it does seem that in many cases, this capacity is often reserved for data that can't find a home elsewhere. 
such as a disciplinary data repository. Uh, often this tends to be social science or humanities data. Uh, and again, the Illinois Data Bank is a good example here. Um, researchers are, are at Illinois are encouraged to use the data bank um, as, a, um, a, as an option when there isn't a suitable external repository uh, available. And then lastly, uh, uh, under this bullet, um, universities do recognize that um, any local uh, curation capacity is going to exist alongside a complex ecosystem of external repositories and other curation-related services that many researchers might have already incorporated into their data management workflows. And our case study partners um, recognize this, and several of them indicated that you know they're not really interested in building um, competing capacity or trying to persuade researchers to drop external curation services in favor of local solutions. Um, now, while curation services um, are often externalized, education and expertise services tend to be locally sourced. And I think an important reason for this is that these services often involve RDM staff interacting or engaging directly with researchers, which would tend to favor you know, local provision. Um, another um, factor here might be that you know, offering some form of locally sourced education and expertise services and probably especially expertise, um, could help the university establish a of RDM credibility uh, in the sense that they can be seen as an active and knowledgeable intermediary um, for local researchers um, coping with data management needs. So something to consider there as well. But even so, um, we do see opportunities for growth in group-scale education or expertise services. Uh, and a good example here is the data curation network which is a collaboration between a group of US uh, university libraries, as well as, I think, the Dryad Data Repository, where they pool and share their respective data curation um, expertise. OK. Now let's talk a bit about choices about scaling RDM services. And we should begin by clarifying what we mean by scaling. So for our purposes, scaling refers to the size of the user community that a particular RDM service is intended to serve. The size of the user community that the service is intended to serve. So in order to sort of clarify our thinking on this topic, we, we put together a very simple three-part framework to illustrate some of the scaling choices that RDM decision makers might face in deploying an RDM service. So in particular, we look at three benchmark scales um, with which to view the potential user community of an RDM service. So starting in the middle, we can imagine RDM services deployed to meet the general RDM needs of a particular institution. So services scaled at the campus level would be intended for general use by you know, a wide spectrum of researchers affiliated with a given university. But we can also think of RDM services that are deployed to meet the specific needs of a particular research cohort on campus. So this moves us below the line to scales of deployment below the campus level. So for example, an RDM service could be deployed to serve a specific research group or institute or a department on campus that has very specialized data management needs. It could be intended to support researchers within a particular disciplinary context, um, say the humanities, for example. Or it could be directed to support a, um, a particular segment of the researcher population at the university, maybe those at a particular stage of their career, like graduate students and postdocs. And then finally, an RDM service could be deployed for use by a user community that cuts across university boundaries. And this moves us above the campus line into a territory where services are scaled for use at levels above the campus. So for example, we could um, imagine services that support researchers within a group of universities, like a consortium, or um, researchers within a particular disciplinary community, uh, regardless of university affiliation. 
So campus scale services support a university's entire research community. Below the campus um, services support a particular segment of a university's researcher community. And above the campus services support a researcher community that basically spans universities. Now I realize this framework is simplistic and, and we can imagine much more nuance to RDM service scaling than, than what, what's reflected here. But the key message we're trying to um, convey is that RDM services can serve different user communities and that the scale of these user communities can be a really important choice variable uh, in shaping an RDM service. So let me try to make this point a little more concrete uh, with some examples from our case study partners. Um, so for each scaling benchmark, um, I include um, one example from each of the service categories in our RDM service framework, education, expertise, and curation. Um, so beginning with campus scale services in the middle, um, a good example for education services is RDM LibGuides since they're typically intended as a general resource for campus researchers looking for RDM-related information. Uh, for expertise, think about um, data management plan review services. Um, there's a good example of a campus-level service for expertise. Several of our case study partners offer services where any campus researcher can submit a draft data management plan to RDM staff uh, for review and feedback. And again, that's offered at the campus level. And then for curation, um, Edinburgh's um, data store service, I think, is a, an example of a campus level curation service. So this service supports active data management um, for all of Edinburgh's research staff and all of its postgraduate research students. So again, a, more of a general campus level service. Now moving to services scaled below the campus, um, an interesting example for education might be Bogenegan's RDM training course aimed at grad students and postdocs. And participants in these courses can actually earn credit from the graduate school upon completion. For expertise, an example of a below the campus approach might be Illinois' data management consultation service for researchers which often um, utilizes library subject specialists in order to blend general data management knowledge with a more focused disciplinary expertise. And an example of a below the campus curation service could be Monash's efforts to develop customized RDM solutions for protein crystallographers on campus, and in particular, supporting the storage and curation of data that's generated from scientific um, uh, instrumentation. And then finally, moving to services scaled above the institution, um, an exe uh, education example is uh, Mantra, uh, which is a free online tutorial, uh, basically on uh, just the importance and basic concepts of RDM. It was actually developed at the University of Edinburgh, but it's linked to and it's used by many other universities around the world as part of their education services. For expertise, think about the data curation network that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, this is an example of, of an above the campus our expertise service where expertise is pooled and shared by multiple universities. And then for curation, 4T research data, which I also mentioned earlier, earlier that's the um, data repository that's used by any researcher affiliated with four uh, Dutch technical universities who collectively form the 4TU consortium. And even though I don't list it here, um, I should mention that disciplinary data repositories like Dryad or um, ICPSR um, would also be prime examples of RDM curation services that are scaled above the institution. So it's um, good to note those as well. So the point th that I think these examples illustrate is that when we think about a university's RDM service bundle, we need to keep in mind that some of these services may be deployed at scales below the campus, some at scales at the campus level, and some at scales above the campus in terms of the user communities they're intended to serve. Now let me um, finish up this uh, section with a few additional observations about scaling RDM services. So as I mentioned earlier, um, differences in data management practices and requirements across disciplinary or research communities 
can result in RDM solutions emerging at scales below the campus, um, in other words, aimed at particular research cohorts on campus. Now, services of this kind obviously are important because they meet an identified data management need for a distinct group of researchers. But we shouldn't overlook the fact that in some cases, RDM solutions that begin at scales below the campus can eventually actually you know, catalyze larger campus-wide RDM deployments. So, for example, um, Monash's uh, early RDM work with protein crystallographers served as a really important proof of concept um, supporting the development of what eventually became the broader university RDM service bundle. Uh, another example um, is at Wageningen, where efforts to acquire RDM capacity really began with support for graduate students in developing data management plans for their doctoral research. And then further services were developed um, uh, at a later time based on what was actually specified in those DMPs. So again, the point being that RDM services developed to serve small segments of the university community can be the starting point for scaling up to support broader uh, user communities. The second observation here has to do with generic versus specialized RDM services. And this is a point that actually came up in our RDM interest group discussions after the first webinar. And the issue here is that when you develop specialized RDM services for distinct research cohorts, it's likely that that RDM service um, is going to require specialized expertise to develop and manage it over and above what may be required to develop, say, a campus-wide repository where general storage and access protocols uh, are applied you know, universally across all data sets. So an example here that comes to mind from our case studies is the Store Monash service, which is Monash's implementation of what's called the MyTARDIS uh, data management platform, uh, which supports the capture and storage of data from scientific um, instruments. So in contrast to a general data repository, this is something that serves a user community that's below campus in scale, and it requires some specialized knowledge about collecting and managing data that's piped from data gathering instruments. So the point here is that while it's good to be able to meet the specialized needs of different research communities on campus, there is often an associated cost in acquiring or developing the specialized expertise needed to deploy these kinds of services. And then lastly, uh, a scaling issue comes up in regard to how the local data repository is positioned vis-a-vis -vis the external RDM service landscape. So to illustrate this, think about whether your campus data repository is intended to collect as many data sets uh, as possible that are produced by local researchers. Is that its goal? Or maybe it, instead, it's intended more as a home for data sets that really can't be deposited elsewhere, such as into a disciplinary repository. So different universities take different positions on this. Um, among our case study partners, um, for example, Edinburgh would very much like its locally deployed RDM services to be seen as the best choice for local researchers um, to meet their RDM needs, rather than as sort of a last resort when external options are not available. But in contrast, Illinois doesn't necessarily see its data repository as a first choice for its researchers, but rather as just one repository among many that can be used when external options don't exist or otherwise not suitable. So as these examples suggest then, there's an implicit scaling issue in how local RDM services are positioned alongside external options. You know, so are local services intended to be the first choice for all campus researchers, or at least as many as possible? If so, if yes, then you've sort of implicitly scaled it as a campus level service. Or is the scale of the user community projected to be smaller, in other words, limited to those campus researchers who don't have a good external data management solution? Well, if the answer is yes there, well, then you've sort of implicitly scaled it to a segment of researchers below the campus level. And this is actually a very, very common example of how scaling becomes an important choice variable in RDM service development. Okay, 
so in the final part of the webinar, um, I'd like to touch on a topic that arises out of sourcing and scaling choices, and that's something we call the interoperability imperative. And I'll motivate this topic by going back to a finding from our second report where we say that no RDM service bundle is an island. All are connected to a greater or lesser degree to the broader external RDM service ecosystem. Now, generally speaking, RDM service bundles are not self-contained, at least the ones that we've seen. Um, they may differ in the degree to which they incorporate external services and resources, but by and large, they're all scoped to leverage some connection to the external RDM service ecosystem. And in addition to this, an RDM service bundle um, will likely include services deployed at a variety of scales, including campus scale services and services that are scaled above or below the campus. So what this means is that an important aspect of deploying an RDM service bundle is to coordinate or manage the interoperability of a set of services that are sourced and scaled in a variety of ways. Now, one of our case study partners, uh, Monash, um, illustrates this idea of integrating a mix of differently sourced and scaled RDM solutions. Um, so data management at Monash involves the integration of a, of a variety of systems. Some of them are deployed internally, some deployed externally, some deployed at campus scale, some at scales above or below the canvas. So this picture illustrates just some, not all, but some of the key components of uh, Monash's RDM service bundle, including an institutional repository, the data repository, um, and the research information management system. So just a, a quick overview of what we're seeing here. Um, starting over on the left, we have what's actually now uh, the decommissioned uh, institutional repository. Um, was recently shut down and research data sets were then migrated to Monash's Figshare instance. We also have Research Data Australia, which is a national discovery service for Australian data sets. And we have Vicnode, which is a storage and preservation service for universities in the state of Victoria in Australia. And then lastly, uh, my research is Monash's instance of uh, the pure research information management uh, system. And among other things, it's used to compile a bibliography of Monash research outputs, including data sets. So the first thing to point out is that we see a mixture of both internally and externally sourced services, as well as a mixture of campus scale and above the campus scale services. So the services in the gray box are campus scale in their deployment. The services in the green box are group scale or above the campus. Um, in terms of internal services, internally sourced services, um, you know, the, the, um, the institutional repository, which I believe was a DSpace instance, um, was internally sourced. Um, VicNode is kind of interesting. It, it's sort of a hybrid internal and externally sourced service that's operated in partnership with the University of Melbourne. And then uh, the rest of the services are externally sourced, including the Figshare instance, the Pure instance, Research and uh, Research Data Australia. So let me just point out a couple of places where interoperability issues um, have come up within this network of differently sourced and differently scaled services. And one is the transfer of metadata about Monash data sets, uh, data sets produced by Monash researchers, from the Figshare instance to Research Data Australia, which is the National Research Data Discovery Service. So this is an important tra uh, transfer point for data among these systems. And actually, Monash recently completed a project uh, to automate this transfer and keep the metadata synchronized between the two systems. Another place where data transfer is important uh, between these systems is between Figshare and, and my research, the RIM system. Uh, and actually, Monash is very keen to improve interoperability here because as things stand now, when metadata comes into one system, it has to be hand-entered um, into the other system. And we found that this tends to be a general problem between RIM systems and data repositories where information synchronization is often handled as a manual process. And that's a bottleneck, obviously. 
Now, interestingly, there's a couple of levels in our, of uh, interoperability to consider in this when we look at, you know, FigShare and the RIM system. Um, there's obviously the technical interoperability in the sense of the two systems talking to each other, but there's also a campus relationship interoperability to, cons to consider as well. As it happens, the FigShare instance is owned by the university library, while the peer instance is owned by the university research office. Now, we could probably fill up an entire webinar discussing the kinds of interoperability issues that arise in stitching together a bundle of services that are sourced and scaled in different ways. But suffice it to say for now that managing these connections, both at a technical and at a relationship level, is really an essential aspect of creating a seamless data management experience for researchers. Now, this discussion of interoperability um, actually gives us an opportunity to mention a new OCLC research report that has just been published. Um, I think it was published yesterday by my colleague, uh, Rebecca Bryant, and a number of other contributors. And I'm actually going to turn things over to Rebecca for a minute uh, to talk about um, a particularly relevant finding from that report that touches on the issue of RDM and interoperability. So um, over to you, Rebecca. OK, thanks, Brian. Yes, the, this report was published yesterday by OCLC uh, jointly with the Eurochris organization, uh, and I've uh, entered the link to that in the chat box here. Um, it's it's uh, based on a survey of close to 400 institutions worldwide related to research information management practices. Uh, what I want to draw to your attention is that we did ask questions of our particip our, of those who participated in the survey related to interoperability um, with uh, institutional repositories, research data repositories, as well as ETD repositories, and have found some interesting things related there. We also have some questions related to compliance as it relates to open access uh, with institutional repositories in support of, of data repositories. So. Um, a lot of questions, you know, related to interoperability. This is just one of about 50 figures uh, from this report uh, and details, um, you know, how we see that there is pretty high interoperability between research information management systems and repository systems, like Brian was demonstrating in the previous example. Uh, and we see, you know, that this is pretty high between institutional repositories, um, and of course, is lower with research data repositories, which I think reflects the fact that fewer institutions have research data repositories. Um, that it's it's sort of something that's new and emerging now, uh, but it is something that we are seeing. And there's a lot more information in the report where we break down, you know, where you can see, um, you know, in the U.S., for instance, we heard no one report that there was any interoperability with research data repositories. So that 16% you see represented here is mostly coming from Australia and Europe. So that's all I'll say about that. I encourage you to look at the report. Uh, it's available open access at the link I provided, uh, as well as um, you can also access, uh, we're sharing the data, the data set, so we're, we're, we're trying to um, make our data available as well. So that's also available through the OCLC website, and um, we encourage you actually to look at the data and possibly use it for your own research. Great. Okay, thanks, uh, Rebecca. Um, all right. Okay. Um, let me try to sum up, we've covered a lot of territory, but let me try to sum up what we've discussed um, um, in the webinar. So I think there's four big messages that I hope you take away from this webinar. Um, the first is that, most important, is that sourcing and scaling are very important choice variables in developing um, an RDM service bundle, in a particular, in developing a particular RDM service. In regard to sourcing, um, important to note that curation services are the most likely to be externalized, education and expertise services most likely to be internalized as things stand now. In regard to scaling, just the idea that RDM services can be deployed to support user communities at campus scale 
as well as scales below campus and above campus, and it's an important choice variable when you're developing an RDM service. And then lastly, that you know, maintaining interoperability across RDM services is an important aspect of managing the RDM service bundle as a cohesive unit. Um, and I might add as a corollary to these findings that, again, I want to stress there's no single one-size-fits-all answer to sourcing and scaling choices. The benefits and trade-offs of internalizing or externalizing RDM capacity or of scaling its deployment below, at, or above the campus is going to differ from university to university according to local circumstances. Um, so as we've done in the previous two webinars, uh, we wanted to supplement our takeaway messages with some takeaway questions that you can ask yourself and discuss with colleagues at your own institution. Um, so the first question, what is the mix of internally and externally sourced services in your university RDM service bundle? In particular, do you see differences in that internal versus external mix across the different service categories, education, expertise, curation? Um, secondly, does your RDM service bundle include services that are scaled below the campus, in other words, that meet the needs of specific research cohorts, or do you um, uh, take advantage of services that are uh, scaled above the campus that are used by multiple universities? Um, what are the interoperability bottlenecks in your RDM services, and in particular, what are the technical obstacles to interoperability, and what are the relationship obstacles? to interoperability that, that you have to um, um, deal with uh, in, in your RDM service bundle. And this fourth question is one I think we asked in all of our webinars uh, with these takeaway questions. If you don't have the information to answer these questions, do you know how to go about getting it? How would you go about, um, who would you talk to to, um, to find out the answers to these questions? Um, so hopefully these, these can give you a starting point in thinking about the sourcing and scaling choices that are built into your own RDM service bundle and um, what some of the implications of those choices might be. And we're going to take up these questions um, and others as well, I'm sure, in our upcoming RDM interest group discussion, which I'll, I'll come back to in just a second. Uh, just a reminder that we do have a website for the Realities of RDM project. Um, you can find uh, all the reports that we've been discussing as well as a, um, a host of other materials uh, that uh, we generated as part of the project. And then just a quick reminder um, that there's one more opportunity uh, to join the uh, um, Research Library Partnership RDM interest group uh, for one of our post-webinar discussions. Uh, so we'll be announcing the next set of interest group calls um, for this webinar um, very shortly. And if you missed any of the previous webinars in this series, uh, you can watch the recordings. Uh, they're actually up on our OCLC Research YouTube channel. And uh, the first two are already up there, and then the recording for this webinar uh, will be up there very soon uh, as well. And one final thing to note, we have a summary of the interest group discussions that that took place following the first webinar. Um, a summary for the interest group discussion that came after the second webinar is going to be up very soon, and, and eventually we'll have a summary of the discussions that are based on those, this webinar uh, as well, so you can uh, look for that. Uh, and I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Um, so I'm, uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. It was a, a long webinar and we covered a lot of ground, but um, hopefully you found it useful. So uh, I know, Rebecca, you've been watching the chat. Um, uh, we have a few minutes for, for any questions or comments that um, anyone might have. Yeah, actually, uh, we have a comment here from Jenny uh, saying, I like um, Brian's concept of the relationship bottleneck. Uh, what, who, who do you need to know? Um, yeah, I do too, actually, Jenny. Thanks. Um, is anybody actually within this, you know, with the challenges of relationships, um, does anybody have specific questions or challenges they're facing in that regard? Um, I'll, I'll I'll sort of say in full disclosure, this is also uh, an area of possible future research um, follow-up for us here because, 
we see the cultural issues of the interoperability uh, as challenging, if probably more so than the technology. Other questions? Uh, while people are queuing up their questions, this is merrily popping in to say that uh, today's webinar has been recorded and as Brian mentioned, we'll be posting um, that to the YouTube channel as well as sending you all a link to that along with um, a link to the slides and any other materials. Um, I know that uh, some folks at University of Delaware seem to have lost sound. I hope you're back reconnected with us, but if not, you can always catch the last couple of minutes uh, in the recording. Apologies. It seems to be working for everybody else. Here's a question, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, it looks like uh, Stephen Hearn asks, how are decisions being made in consortial RDM context? Um, I, Brian, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, obviously, we we, we did see the example of um, of um, in the Netherlands, the 4TU consortium, where you know you did have this group of universities that sort of coalesced around the problem. Excuse me, I'm starting to lose my voice. I have the um, the first cold of the uh, winter season, and it's uh, my, my throat my throat is giving out here, but. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, so they coalesced around, you know, the problem RDM problem, and and developed a consortial solution, particularly the data repository. But we don't um, see that as much um, in other countries, and in particular in the U.S. Um, it seems to me that um, you know you you see very uh, very few consortial scale RDM uh, solutions, and many universities are sort of view that basically going to go it alone and develop, um, you know, essentially institution scale capacity. So I, I think, I, I guess like Rebecca, I, I don't have a, I don't have a good explanation for that, but I think it's something worth, worth looking into because it seems to me that many RDM services are tailor-made for um, above the institution, above the campus uh, solutions. I don't have anything further to add uh, to that. I also see a question from Megan Potterbush, um, who, who comments that relationship bottlenecks can happen here uh, in just identifying the below the campus services that are offered by groups outside of the library. Uh, and she's interested in tips for identifying these. Um, and what I'll basically say here, Megan, is that I think we'll have the opportunity in our interest group discussions um, later this month to actually sort of talk about this because um, I uh, I think that that can be a major challenge. I will say this is from my own experience working in uh, the graduate college at the University of Illinois for many years. I think a key partner can really be the graduate school or graduate college, um, which may also be actually in the Office of Research about 50% of the time here in the U.S. Um, and I, I think that they're a really useful partner because um, they may have some policy interests, but they also have strong relationships with each of the graduate programs and departments, and so can um, maybe help you identify and connect with those um, because they're, they're a more central unit that, that also has those relationships. Uh, and we did a lot of partnering uh, with the library uh, in that role and it was really beneficial for each of us to know what the other was offering and to help promote in that way. Uh, and then um, the last question I think here is from Jen Smith is, with regard to externalizing curation, what are people's experiences of services such as Springer Nature data support? Um, and those, the other ones might also be, you know, things like Mendeley Data or Figshare. Um, since we're sort of almost out of time, what I'll say is I'm, I'm sort of storing up these questions and we'll return to these and make sure that we cover these in, in the interest group discussions. Yeah, and, and one small point about that, I mean, that, um, 
one of the things that came up, I think it was after the second webinar, <laughs> excuse me, um, where, where, the, where the nature of commercial service level agreements and how they sort of aligned with um, data curation um, needs on campus. And um, that seemed to be an area that would benefit from, um, you know, um, some looking into because um, there were some problems uh, that arise where what's being offered is not necessarily what's what what's needed or expected. Okay. Well, we are at time here. Uh, we're going to return Brian's voice to him uh, for resting up, and it looks like uh, <laughs> you guys are well set up for um, continuing discussions in the interest group. As I mentioned, um, uh, this record this webinar has been recorded. Uh, we'll be sending links out to you shortly. Thank you so much for uh, your participation and your interest in this uh, topic area and everything that we do here in the OCLC Research Library Partnership. Um, thanks today uh, to our presenters today. And this concludes today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody.